Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Martha Macaluso, and I am a myofunctional therapist at Manhattan Myofunctional Therapy, LLC. And I am here interviewing Mr. Patrick McKeown, who is a world leader in buteco breathing re-education. Patrick has published various books, including his bestsellers, Close Your Mouth, Asthma Free Naturally, and Anxiety Free, Stop Worrying and Quiet Your Mind. And his latest book titled The Oxygen Advantage, which I'm holding right here, The Oxygen Advantage, um, helps to improve sports performance by addressing dysfunctional breathing patterns and simulating high altitude training. It's a must read. Uh, Patrick, it is a true honor. So now tell us a little bit about Buteco breathing and uh, welcome. Sure, thanks very much, Marta. Uh, great, to, great to join you and talk about this important topic. Um, I think there's a great connection here with myofunctional therapy. Um, of course, your aspect is looking at restoring nasal breathing and exercises as well, which are very important for, for the upper airways and position of the tongue. Uh, it's an area, I suppose, that has received quite a lot of attention in the last few years. And what I hope to do over the next few minutes is just to point out the direction of where the science is going with it. So it's really looking at, it's looking at breathing re-education and the influence that it has in, in sleep disorder breathing. So the first connection that I want to do is, um, just bear with me one second here is looking just at the incidence of obstructive sleep apnea, when we consider that approximately 20% of US adults can be affected by OSA, and 90% of these people are undiagnosed, and that is pretty much, could be literally a car crash waiting to happen. Um, the whole aspect of it is that we have a huge cohort of the population, they're feeling fatigued, it has a major stress in their health, um, their productivity, their quality of life is reduced. And also when we look at children, there's a knock-on effect at mouth breathing children. It's altering the shape of the face, setting back the jaw, so it's increasing the risk of OSA for these kids later in life. This poll here came up with a similar statistic. It said 31% of men and 21% of women are indicating a high risk of OSA, but when it goes with obesity, it can increase to as high as 57%. And that's a huge change. So once we develop obesity, it does have an effect on our breathing. And fat too, having too much fat around the belly region, it has an effect on lung function in that it prevents and reduces the ability of the diaphragm to work properly. Mm. So there's an interaction there that when our breathing is affected in the lower airways, it can also affect the dilating muscles of the upper airways. And when we look at OSA, we need to look at a number of things. One is the intraluminal air pressure. This is the pressure generated as air is sucked into the lungs. So during inhalation, how fast is the individual breathing? How much pressure, negative pressure is generated that can contribute to the walls collapsing? We also need to look at the upper airway dilator muscle activity. In other words, the message that messages that are sent to the upper airways to remain open. We need to look at the extra luminal tissue pressure, and this is the pressure that's exerted as we gain weight in the neck region. So at some point, our necks continue to grow in size outwards, but at some point, if they won't grow any more outwards, they'll start growing inwards. So if you have a large neck size, it'll often contribute to a narrow airway. And then surface forces, including, say, for example, surfactant. So, and we're going to get through a few of these. We've got 10 minutes. We'll get through the most of them. And it's really just joining the dots of breathing and the effect of breathing in OSA. Mm -hmm. Coming back to basics, OSA is when there's collapse of the upper airways. It occurs if the negative upper airway pressure generated by the inspiratory pump muscles exceeds the dilating force of these upper airway muscles. So how much pressure is generated as air is sucked into the lungs? And are the airways able to remain open as air is brought into the lungs? If the negative pressure during inspiration is greater than the, dil than the dilating forces of the upper airway muscles, we're going to have possible collapse. So there's two plays going on there. We need to look at breathing. We look need to look at the negative pressure during breathing. And we also need to look at the dilating forces of the upper airway muscles. And one key aspect of this is mouth versus nose. There's a two and a half fold increase in upper airway resistance during sleep when breathing is 
through the mouth as compared to nasal breathing. So that says a lot, you know, that the resist, resistance, because here if we look at what's called the Venturi effect, and the Venturi effect states that when the diameter of a tube decreases, um, the, the pressure created as fluid or air is drawn through that fluid, drawn through that tube increases. So the best way to think of this is if you were watering your garden and you have a hose, and for you to get the water a lot longer distance, you choke the hose. So by reducing the diameter of the water hose, the pressure increases and the water goes a longer distance. And of course, resistance during sleep, if the upper airways are decreasing as a result of mouth breathing, it's going to increase the negative pressure. Mouth breathing is associated with quite a few significant changes, reduction of the retropalatal and retroglossal areas, lengthening of the pharynx, um, because if there's lengthening of the pharynx, there's a greater area that can be exposed to collapse. Mm -hmm. And in pediatrics, when we look at the, the picture that we're looking in front of us, we see the diameter of a mouth breather is almost half, and um, sorry, the airway volume of a mouth breather is almost half that of a nose breather. So when the diameter of an airway reduces, the area volume will decrease significantly because we're using that for formula pi r squared. Um, so, you know, a small change in the diameter or radius of the upper airway can significantly decrease the air, airway volume. And if the airway volume is decreased, the upper, you know, negative pressure as air is drawn into the lungs is going to increase. And of course, we never consider this. If you breathe through your mouth versus breathing through the nose, what, what messages are sent to the upper airways? So earlier on, I said that OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, would happen if the negative pressure as air is drawn into the lungs exceeds the dilating forces of the airways to remain open. Well, if we breathe through an open mouth, there's less messages sent to the upper airways to remain open. If we breathe through the nose, there's a greater amount of messages sent to the upper airways. In other words, the muscles work harder when breathing is through the nose than through the mouth. And again, the nasal root for inhalation may provide important afferent input to protect the upper airways from collapse. Yeah. Airway patency, another thing that can be related to mouth breathing and nose breathing. When we breathe through the mouth, the upper airways dry out. And the surface tension of the upper airway lining liquid plays an important role in the control of upper airway patency. Mm -hmm. So when surfactant is released into the upper airway, it reduces the severity of obstructive associated sleep disorder breathing. And we have to think of it this way. If the airways are drying, they're more liable to collapse, but also the pressure required to reopen the airways are, is greater because of the stickiness factor. So here, mouth breathing during sleep has the potential to increase the dryness of the upper airway mucosal surface. Subsequent increased wall stickiness may then make the upper airway more difficult to reopen after closure. So this is something that's going to contribute to the severity of the apnea. Um, so the occurrence is the, the number of events per hour, but the severity is how long does the collapse continue for? So if the airway is closed and then it's sticky, there's a greater pressure required to reopen them um, due to the dehydration, basically because if we breathe through the mouth, moisture is going to be sucked out of the upper airways. And not only does it increase the stickiness, but it also contributes to inflammation. And I think a lot of people will be familiar with it. You know, they went out, maybe have a few drinks of alcohol one night, and they wake up the next morning and their throat just feels raw and inflamed. Well, that's the passing of a large volume of air through the narrow space, which is causing inflammation which in turn is reducing airway diameter um, and other factors that are going on along with it. And we're just going to kind of look at this just for a couple of minutes before we wrap up, but it's very difficult to find what's the percentage time that we spend with our mouth open versus mouth closed. And when you look at, say, a study like this, it's looking at the sleep in normal subjects. And the, per, the percentage time spent with the mouth open was 7.6% during the day and during sleep was 4.3%, but that's not what I see in clinical practice. And that's probably not what you see. Yeah. And we know from studies with children that over 50% of studied children breathe habitually through an open mouth. We have no studies for adults. What's the percentage population of the adult population that habitually breathe through an open mouth, both during the day and also during sleep? Because ultimately, 
how we breathe during the day is going to influence how we breathe during sleep. Mm -hmm. So if we were looking at this statistic here, we would say that mouth breathing is not a problem. But then again, we have to look at who was the study aimed at, normal subjects. I think we, re we really should be looking at, you know, what's the percentage, what's the fraction of oral breathing in people with a higher risk of OSA? Mm -hmm. Here, they looked at 41 subjects, um, each 30-second sleep epoch, which was not affected by apneas or hypopneas, and scored it for the presence of nasal or oral breathing. Overnight, out of the 41, seven subjects breathed through their nose. One subject breathed both through the nose and through the mouth, and a remainder switched between nose and mouth breathing. Oral only breathing rarely occurred. So again, looking at this study, it will say that individuals don't really mouth breathe. Yeah. So when we go to the next part of it though, this paper found that subjects greater than 40 years were approximately six times more likely than younger subjects to spend more than 50% of sleep epochs utilizing oral nasal breathing. And there's something in this because this is the population which is also at higher risk of OSA. As we get older, do we spend more time with our mouth breathing? And during mouth breathing, is that um, contributing to the severity and the occurrence of OSA during sleep? Mm -hmm. Another one, not just mouth breathing should we look at, but we should also look at, are the jaws falling apart? Mm -hmm. So here, the percentage of total sleep time spent with the mandibular op opening in other words, that the jaws are coming apart by greater than five millimeter was significantly larger in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, 69%. So here is the question. Is it that these individuals are breathing through the mouth during sleep or should we be considering whether the jaws are coming apart, that the mouth is in a more open position? Because if the mouth is in a more open position, it's going to reduce airway space. So even though the individual may be breathing through the nose, we need to also consider um, whether the mouth, whether the jaws are together, when the, whether the mandible and the maxilla is, is together or whether they're apart. Because if they're apart, it may be also contributing. Um, and you see the difference here, 69% with OSA, greater than five, five millimeter of mouth open versus healthy adults without OSA, 11%. It's six times greater with OSA. We have to ask the question why, and we also have to ask the question, is it contributing to the OSA? Mm -hmm. So a very simple exercise to decongest the nose, given that we were talking about it, <laughs> and we kind of wrap it up with this, mm -hmm. but it's, if we hold our breath, um, it will cause you know, an increase of nasal nitric oxide in the, in the nasal cavity, and also it increases carbon dioxide in the blood, and it also activates the sympathetic nervous system. And all of these factors may be contributing to unblocking of the nose. But for your listeners, it's a very simple exercise. You take a normal, and just before you start it, if you're pregnant or if you've got high risk of, you know, if you've got any serious medical complaints, including high blood pressure, you're better off avoiding it. But other than that, it's a, it's a fairly safe exercise. If you take a small breath into your nose, a small breath out through your nose and you pinch your nose and all you have to do is just gently nod your head up and down and hold your breath and continue holding your breath until you feel a fairly strong air shortage. When you feel a fairly strong air shortage, then let go but breathe in through your nose and then calm your breathing and then to calm your breathing. So to keep the lips together. So if you do that and then you wait a minute and you try it again, wait a minute, try it again, wait a minute, try it again. On the sixth attempt, your nose should be feeling more open. And really the crux about this is, we looked at just a short 10 minute se segment. <laughs> if we have the mouth open, it reduces the diameter or the volume of the upper airways. It also increases the stickiness factor. Um, mouth breathing also causes drying out of the upper airways in contributing to inflammation. And all of these factors is gonna to contribute to the severity of OSA. So the rule of thumb is, the very first step is breathe through the nose both during the day and breathe through the nose during sleep. So for your listeners, pay attention to how we're breathing because if we're waking up at a dry mouth in the morning, um, it could signify that the mouth is open during sleep and that's only going to affect your sleep disorder breathing. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's a true honor to have had you um, teach us about the importance of nasal breathing 
and uh, thank you very much for everything. Sure. No, you're very welcome. My pleasure, Marta. Right. Take care.